Welcome to our congregation, Lador Vador. Tonight, we have a special edition of a brand new program called Parson to Parson. With us, we have Rabbi Barry Silver and as co-host, Pastor Fritz Oftenkamp. Tonight is our first edition of Pastor to Pastor, which is a remake of Rabbi Sam Silver's Pastor to Pastor radio show from many years ago that we're reproducing on Zoom for Lador Vador. And tonight is Monday, February 7th. Take it away, co-hosts. Thank you so much, Sharon. It's actually Parson to Parson, of course, a play on words of person to person. My dad had a radio program by that name for many, many years. And I decided in his honor, as a tribute to him, I would resurrect that radio program with today's technology so that we can exhume the wisdom of the past and resume his history of dialogue with Parson to Parson. I scoured the world, I searched the entire internet for the best minister to have as a co-host. Oh, and I, it was very easy to determine that it should be Fritz Aftenkamp, outspoken, <laughs> intrepid, courageous speaker. He's been brought up on charges of heresy and lived to talk about it. Great defender of truth and of the Jewish people. So we're going to co-host this and we'll have guests come on. Today though, on the first session, thought maybe we don't need guests. We just wanted to uh, have some time for him and for the audience to discuss an issue that is of very grave importance now and is very controversial and is being talked about all over. That is Holocaust education, book banning, counter uh, cultural silencing, and um, Whoopi Goldberg, Mouse, and the whole issue of cancel culture and what it's okay to say and what it's not okay to say. Uh, Pastor Alfenkamp and I both have quite a bit of experience on what you can say and not say. I recently, for the first time in my history, writing for the Jewish Journal every other week, had an article censored <laughs> over this topic of anti-Semitism. It was not allowed to be published. I was told to tweak it, and I refused to do so. If they weren't going to publish it as is, I had no interest in printing a watered-down, diluted version. So I have some familiarity with this quite a bit. Did he say how you should tweak it? Did he say how you should tweak it? Yeah, it was um, it was an article that I wrote called Jacques which is the name of an article that was written in the late 1800s in France during the Dreyfus Affair, when uh, Colonel Dreyfus, who was the highest ranking Jewish military person in France, was framed, and the government knew it was a frame. The person who committed the crime admitted it, but they still sent him to Devil's Island and harassed and persecuted him for 12 years. An, an author, Emil Zola, wrote an article in which he was saying that France claims to be liberated and free and modern, yet it has succumbed to anti-Semitism. And he says, j'accuse, I accuse not just the military, but the French government and the culture for still succumbing to anti-Semitism. And, um, Theodor Herzl read that article, a journalist, and it convinced him that the only safe place for Jews was Israel, and he founded the modern Zionist movement, and he uh, coined the immortal words in Tzu and Zolgada, if you will it, it's no dream, and that article and Theodor Herzl led to the foundation of Israel. It, so my article was called Jacques Tues. I was accusing the Jewish establishment of failing to speak out about anti-Semitism and saying that it, a large responsibility for the Holocaust and anti-Semitism is in Christian scripture, which apparently is taboo. Christian clergy are allowed to talk about it, but rabbis are not. The Jewish community is not. We still live in a shtetl. And apparently the Judenrat, the Jewish leaders, so-called leaders who are now leading the Jewish community 
don't want to upset our masters. And so we're not allowed to talk about that. So, so we we are in Tim, a Christ, the Christian. So many Christians in this country still intimidate the Jews. Absolutely, Thank we are God. we're self censored. Uh, so I've heard some Jewish leaders say we've made such great strides in being accepted by the Christian community and welcomed by them. We don't want to rock the boat and we don't want to do anything to ruffle their feathers. So just uh, lay low, you know. There's a, a Yiddish expression. Other people probably know it better than I do. Sit still. Or sha, sha still. It means be quiet because Jews were used to in Europe, if you spoke up, they would kill you. And so they were used to knowing their place. I don't know my place. I wasn't born at that time. My place is to tell the truth. But apparently that doesn't work so well anymore. And at the I, Jewish Journal, I couldn't tell the truth. Are you saying that the Jews are enabling the Christians? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I, I get a lot of flack from Jewish people. If I mention the legacy of Christian anti-Semitism and link it up with the Holocaust, invariably, I get a lot of negative reactions, sometimes hate mail, sometimes censorship. Yes, and I was just in the exhibit today with the cattle car and afterwards, I asked the person who ran the exhibit, they have an explanation of anti-Semitism afterwards, they explained how the Holocaust came about, the history of it. And I said to him, why no mention of Christianity and its role in anti-Semitism? And he was like, well, of course, I'm not going to say that. That would be totally out of the question. They wouldn't even consider that. So the what I put, the paragraph that I put actually had you in it, Fritz. You'll be, you'll be pleased to know that you too have been banned and censored by the Jewish Journal because I said leading Christian scholars and historians like James Carroll, Bishop Shelby Spong, and Pastor Fritz Aftenkamp have acknowledged the role of Christian anti-Semitism in leading to the Holocaust. And that those lines were deemed inappropriate and not allowed in the Jewish Journal. Uh, that's amazing amazing i turn it over to you for your reaction to that and the whole topic it is it, it is it's truly amazing uh when i first got into trouble with what i was saying i was called a wolf in sheep's clothing and uh, i was also called this from a pulpit and people today, in fact, my older brother called me that uh, a few days ago. And what's ironic about that is that I, the, the last thing I am is in disguise. I have always said before a thousand members of the church, I said exactly what I believed. No hidden mystery behind it. I was not disguising myself. I was telling them exactly what I believed. No, no wolf in sheep's clothing, just a, uh, a person sharing what he truly believed. You know what your problem was, Fritz? You was actually that? were telling the truth and things that many Christians know and believe, but don't say outside of Christian circles. And so it's not that you were in sheep's clothing, it's that you were upsetting the flock. <laughs> because the sheep who are part of many congregations, Jewish, Christian, Muslim, whatever, they just blindly follow like sheep in a flock. That's why the congregation is often called a flock. What you did is you exposed the truth, things that people don't say in polite company, but many of them believe. I'm putting together a writing. It's going to be entitled A Wolf in Sheep's Clothing. And uh, we have in Christianity a shadow theology. You can talk to many Christian ministers, Presbyterian, whatever, and uh, many of them believe it. And universal salvation, which is certainly an improvement over our present understanding of salvation, uh, it's universal salvation, so there's no need for hell because everybody, supposedly Jesus died for everyone, whether they accept him or not, according to a lot of these uh, preachers who are trying to get around our theology. And I call it a shadow theology because th they're fearful of making this shadow theology public. They don't want to say it publicly, but they, in their own hearts, they, they, they kind of realize that this is pretty crazy what we're preaching. Yeah, well, the problem that the Christian religion has is that it's based on replacement theology. It's stuck with the Jewish scripture, which says Jews are the chosen people. 
but they're proclaiming that Jews are no longer chosen. That was the Christians. So they got some explaining to do. And they have to say, well, God rejected the Jews. He chose them at one point. He rejected them because they rejected Jesus, killed Jesus, didn't accept him. And now they've accepted the Christians. So that's a really difficult argument to make without, of course, vilifying the Jews, which is done in Christian scripture. The problem is that we're not allowed to tell the truth when it comes to religion. We can't just say, we can't acknowledge what is. We have to pretend. I want to give you an example of that. I have an article from ish.com. That's an Orthodox website. And it says, there's no Hebrew word for race. And so what they're saying is in the Torah, they don't even have a word for race. See, there's biblical Hebrew, and then Hebrew is the only language in the world that was recreated, resurrected from the dead, and now there's modern Hebrew. And in modern Hebrew, they had to create words like bicycle, which is uh, ofanayim, or a movie theater, kolnoa. Ofanayim is from wheel, and it means two wheels. Kolnoa is like a moving voice. So they had to create words. Aviron is an airplane from avir for air. So another word that they had to make up or create was geza. Geza means race. And what Esh.com is saying is that the Jewish religion is so enlightened and so sublime. We don't even have a word for race. So we, we can't possibly be racist because we don't even have a word for it. Then they go on to say, well, of course, there's an aberration. There are some Jews who have succumbed. But in general, we don't have racism because we don't have the word race. Now. What he's saying, to some extent, is true. In the Torah, there's uh, legends of King Solomon and Queen Sh of Sh and uh, the Queen of Sheba and the Ethiopians, and they had relations with each other. And there's never a mention about, well, these people are different because they're black. It's kind of like those differences didn't really matter because of race. Although there is a story where the siblings of Moses accuse him of marrying a dark-skinned woman, the daughter of a, Median, a Midianite priest. And, and one of them says, he's, she, uh, Miriam and Aaron are complaining about Moses and say, hey, and by the way, that wife of yours, she's, uh, she's dark-skinned. And so uh, according to the Torah, God was so outraged at that, that he struck Miriam with leprosy, as if to say in a mocking way, oh, you like white? okay, I'll make you white. And then, of course, he punished the woman, but not the man, even though Aaron was also mocking Moses. And then Moses says the shortest prayer in the Bible, Rafuana, cure her, and she's cured. But it's, a, it's meant to teach that God has no tolerance for racism, even you, by Miriam and Aaron. Are you saying there's no word in the Jewish language for race? What I'm saying is in ancient Hebrew, biblical Hebrew, read through the whole Torah. You'll never see a word for race because they didn't have the word race. They didn't, they didn't have a concept of three races, black, white, oriental. I don't even know if they knew about oriental. But so what I'm saying is that Ish HaTorah, this Orthodox, is acting like the Jews were beyond racism. But here's what they don't say. Okay, this is what they do not say in Ish Ha Torah, they don't say that in the Torah, Ham, one of the sons of Noah, which is how we know he wasn't kosher because he named his son Ham. Ham, one of the sons of Noah, um, supposedly sees his father's nakedness when his father Noah got drunk. Now it was inadvertent. He just walked in and there he was. So it says that he was punished. How was he punished? He says, your children will be slaves to your siblings. The word ham is in Hebrew, ham means warm or hot. And ham is said in the Bible to be the ancestor, the progenitor of the African nations. That line in the Torah was used by Southern racists to say, hey, this is ordained by God. We're just following the the God's law that the blacks were supposed to be the slaves of the whites. And that was the used- Lord the mark right. is black. The mark is being black, right? Supposedly. The mark? Yeah. The, the name Ham. Oh, means he was marked. 
Right. And so, right. So his children were said to be the African nations, but yes. there wasn't, but there wasn't a word for race per se. There's enough, but I'm, what I'm saying is there's clearly elements of racism in the Torah that was used to support racism in modern times in America. Now there's another example also, which is familiar to most. In Hebrew, the word for nation is goy. And um, in Hebrew, we're supposed to be or legoyim. We're a light to the nations. But the word goy, meaning nation, has come to mean something derogatory. It's come to be used by many Jews as a non-Jew in a not in a derogatory manner. Oh, it's a goy. So it's also used in a neutral way. We say, it's a beautiful song, nation shall not lift up sword against nation. But there are elements of racism. We also have in the Torah that the Jews are am segula, we're a chosen people. So we might not have races, but we were deemed to be chosen for special treatment by God. And we also, of course, know that in modern times, there are Jews who are very much racist, even though they have a history of being persecuted because of race. And many of the settlers are very unsettling in their attitude towards Palestinians. It's not racist because Palestinians are Semites like Jews are, but it's biased and discriminatory. Now, Israel has a good reason to be upset with the Palestinians who have been constantly attacking them and killing innocent people. But on the right wing, there's an element that's very distasteful that goes beyond the normal type of uh, concern for security. So I'm just trying to suggest that every group has racism in it, but they all try to cover it over and pretend it doesn't exist. You say so, Malcolm X was a racist? Well, he sure seemed that way to me. He, <laughs> what he, do you he think? Wanted, he wanted separate. He wanted separate, separate. He wanted people to live, blacks and whites to live separately, at least at one point in his career. And my, my understanding is, and I don't know that much about it, but he seemed like he started out really wanting to live totally separately and saying that the whites were like devils and stuff. But then later on in his life, as yeah, I'm sure, he mellowed, mellowed, I think. Yeah, he mellowed out quite a bit. Um, yeah. Fritz, what's your take on uh, Whoopi Goldberg? Do you have any thoughts or about the banning of uh, Mouse? <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't know about it till I, I think I saw her on the Today Show or Sunday morning or someplace. Oh, and Col was it Colbert? Maybe it was. Anyway, she could not bend over enough apologizing for what happened. I, I think she was um, she was uh, sh shocked at her own understanding of the word race. And she had a, certainly a different take on it than what uh, a lot of people did. And she, she made the mistake of what she said, what the Nazis, at least the Nazis were not racist. I think that was, I'm not sure, but maybe someone else can correct me, but I think that was kind of the phrase that came through that really nailed her, I guess. Well, <laughs> but you she, know, yeah, go ahead. Uh, what I'm saying is that uh, we do make people pay a heavy price for uh, s s some things that, that, that they say that perhaps they do need a, they do need a timeout, but uh, uh, I don't know. What about Jeff? What about Zuckerberg who was, uh, had, who left CNN well, that's that's totally off the subject, though. But I'm talking about uh, uh, treating people who do make who do some, some things that uh, we we judge uh, not okay, but the, the the penalty can be quite severe. Well, it seems like there's certain guardians of political correctness and people who are like uh, censors who, if you cross a line, they're going to jump all over you. And many yeah. times, there's a financial motive because they send out these tweets or these uh, things by the internet. And then they say, look what Whoopi said, send me $100. Look what he just did, send me a $50 donation. So there's this financial incentive to elevate yourself by calling people out, which is which kind of muddies the water. But as far as what Whoopi Goldberg did, I think there's a few things that we should keep in mind. One is that just because she's famous, doesn't make her an authority on the Holocaust or racism or Nazism. She's clearly not. It seems from her comments that she's ignorant, but the problem is she gets carried away with her own fame. So she thinks she's an expert on it because she's yeah. famous. Instead of just saying, I, I don't really know much about this, but here's what I think. 
she acts like she knows everything and she's pontificating to others. That was That's a mistake where we think famous people know more than we do. The other problem with Whoopi is this. When she said the Holocaust has nothing to do with race, she doesn't understand the Holocaust very well because to the Nazis, it had everything to do with race. They consider themselves a master race and they consider Jewish people very much to be a race and to be an inferior race and one of the worst. Right, so to the Nazis, it had everything to do with race. What Whoopi Goldberg was saying was, well, it couldn't be race because it was just white people killing white people. So in, in her mind, if yeah. it doesn't involve persecuting blacks, then there's no worries. Yeah. There's no issue. It's not a problem. And it's certainly not racist. She, yeah. she can't conceive of the fact that there might be other victims of hatred and genocide other than blacks. And so it came across to me very, very insensitive and, uh, and, and very, very ignorant. Also, her yeah. name, Goldberg, from what I've read, was chosen purely for pragmatic reasons because she was told that that's a good way to get more attention for yourself, to pretend that you're Jewish and your name is gonna sound really odd, a Whoopi Goldberg, a black person. So she was told to do it for stage purposes. And then she acts kind of like she's Jewish sometimes and kind of like she's not. I don't really appreciate people pretending to be Jewish and then perhaps speaking for the Jewish people that it's not, a, it doesn't sit well with me, but I'm not sure that the ADL or anyone else are the arbiters who should determine what her punishment should be. Well, if someone converts to Judaism, uh, would you consider them a Jew? Of course, I convert people all the time to Judaism. In fact, I consider them more Jewish than others very often because <laughs> most of us are just born Jewish. We have nothing to say about it. To convert to Judaism, and you made a conscious decision. I, I like the Jewish people. I love Judaism so much. I want to be Jewish. So yes, I consider them every bit. We call them Jews by choice. Absolutely. Um, I think Stacy has something to say. Go ahead. I, I disagree with everything you said about Whoopi Goldberg. I don't okay. think she's ignorant. <laughs> I do not think she's racist. She, she did say something that she probably should not have said. It was not said with malice on her part. It's how she views race. She definitely is a friend to the Jewish people. She is not one bit anti-Semitic. And I really, I have forgiven her totally, especially since she has asked for forgiveness. Okay. Tell me what, what is it that I said that you disagree with? You, you said she was ignorant. She is not an ignorant person. And I, I saw her on a show once and she was asked why she, why, how she got the name Whoopi Goldberg. She took Whoopi from Whoopi Cushion because she's a comedian. And she said she took Goldberg because she, she feels Jewish. <laughs> well, so if I feel Christian, I guess I can call myself a Christian and speak Well, why not? Why not? Because if, being if somebody Jewish, feels that they are Jewish, do you, do you have to follow the rules to, be, to feel you're Jewish? Of course not. I don't follow the rules. But to, be Jewish, but to be Jewish means either, being Jewish is a lot of different things. Either you're part of the Jewish culture, you're part of Jewish civilization, you have Jewish ethical values, you were born into the Jewish religion, or you converted into Judaism. There's different ways of being Jewish, unlike Christian, where it's just a belief system. You can be Jewish in many, many, many different ways, okay? But normally, if somebody's not Jewish at birth, and then they decide they want to be Jewish, there are certain criteria for what it means. It's not like, okay, I'm Jewish. It's not quite that simple. All right, can so, I just finish you with and, and if you and if you don't and if you don't recognize that, I say you're ignorant. If, if you if there's an organization or a group of people, and you just say, okay, I'm a member of it, without even knowing what it re what's required to become a member of that group. It's like, I could call myself a doctor, but if no, I don't even know no, what it takes to be a doctor. Not the same thing at all. Not the it same is. thing at there, all. There, there, are, there are criteria. There are criteria for being Jewish. If there were no criteria, then being Jewish would mean nothing. And to is, me, it means Is something. Ivanka Trump Jewish? I have no idea. But I'm just saying that to, to be Jewish, there's certain criteria. 
we're not so amorphous and not so nebulous that anybody can just say I'm Jewish. But I don't know. I don't know that what her values and her views are. I've never heard her pontificators say I'm Jewish because these are my views. I have read in the media that she said she was Jewish because it would help her career. I've never I heard her say. Definitely not. Definitely. I've never heard her say I'm Jewish because I believe in the universality of all people, or I espouse Jewish values, or I believe in Emmet Batsedek, or I've never heard anything like that. Secondly, I do maintain, you, you say you disagree with me because you think she's not ignorant. I say, if somebody says that the Holocaust had nothing to do with race, then you're ignorant, period. And, uh, and I don't know but any other way of saying it. She, she has admitted that she has changed her view, but what race meant to her was the color of your skin. That's ignorant. Wow. It's ignorant. If you think that race is just a matter of the color of your skin, that's grotesquely ignorant. There's a I'm, lot more to race. Mis maybe misinformed. There, there's, well, okay, you say misinformed, I say ignorant, it's the same thing. But the problem is that not, not only was she ignorant, but she didn't change her view she was responding to a, a hail of criticism and then she said, okay, I take it back. It well, would make, I, I would be more confused. Thing, the first thing she said was that the Holocaust was about man's inhumanity to man. And that yeah. certainly was true. No, that's, a, that's, another, that's another example of anti-Semitism. It was not simply man's inhumanity to man. It was persecuting Jews after 2000 years. It, what, 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 I, what it struck me as doing was to trivialize and to take away the Jewish suffering aspect of it and then say, I know, because I'm Jewish, so therefore I'm an expert on it. It wasn't just man's and man. And, a, and also was not, as she said, white against white. She said, well, it was white people killing white people, as if to suggest, well, hey, it's no big deal because the blacks are the only ones who really are, have the market cornered on suffering, and this is just white people killing white people. The thing is this. If you say something that is ignorant or whatever word you want to say, I don't know, clueless or whatever word you want, euphemism you want to say, if you say something like that and then somebody says, hey, you know, that wasn't cool, then if you want to make a sincere apology or say something to show some type of remorse, you would explain what you said and why and then give an educated response. So she might say, well, I don't consider Jews to be a race, which is perfectly okay. Most people don't. I don't consider Jews to be a race either. So she could say, I didn't, I don't consider Jews to be a race. And therefore they couldn't be the victims of race hatred because they're not a race. That's what I had in mind. But I do understand that to the Nazis, the Nazis saw themselves as the superior race and they considered Jews to be an inferior race. So in their minds, they were targeting Jews because of racism. So what I said was when it had nothing to do with race, I was talking about from my subjective point of view. Not, I mean, if she said something intelligent like that. She did like say that. something like that. No, she, <laughs> she didn't but, say but anything. That, the show that Fritz saw her on, she <laughs> was bending over backwards to apologize. She, she and, say, and I felt it was sincere. She didn't say anything remotely like what I just said. I don't even know if she's capable of it because I think she's, pardon the expression, ignorant. Okay, who, who else would like to? Valerie There's two. Valerie had her hand raised as well as Roberta. I'm not sure who was first. So duke it out, guys. Go ahead, Valerie. Okay, go ahead. And then um, Harris. Well, first of all, to answer Stacy about Ivanka, she went through a mikvah. She's married to an Orthodox Jew. She's accepted in Israel. So to answer, just to address that, she is, she did go through the entire ultra Orthodox uh, requirements to convert. That's, I'm talking about Ivanka. As far as Whoopi Goldberg is concerned, I couldn't give a damn what the hell she says. Anything she says, anything she does doesn't change my life. It has no impact on my life. I don't even pay attention to her. So why we're having this argument over a non-issue is beyond me. So, you know, I don't give her much thought. So this argument to me about what she says and what she doesn't say, half the people on that program don't know what the hell they're talking about. They're talking about headlines. They're talking about what they think they know. And that's what that program is. It's an entertainment program. It has nothing to do with facts. It has nothing to do with religion. It has nothing to do with anything at all, except, you know, let's recreate and rehash the headlines. That's all they do. And they repeat what everybody else, what, what they're hearing. 
So, you know, you can't give a lot of credence to anybody that appears on those kinds of programs. That's well, all I have to say. Let me just respond briefly that whether they know what they're talking about or not is not the issue. The issue is that they influence many, many millions of people. And so what I'm saying is if they do, they should be responsible and be educated. By the way, I never, I didn't say that Whoopi Goldberg was anti-Semitic. Um, I think, Stacey, you might, you might mischaracterize what I'm saying. I didn't say she's anti-Semitic. And I didn't say she doesn't like Jewish people. That's not what I'm saying. What I said was she's ignorant because she doesn't know much about the Holocaust. She doesn't even understand about it. And she doesn't realize what led to it and other things, but that doesn't make her anti-Semitic. It just makes her ignorant because she doesn't know much about the topic. But to, as um, Valerie's saying, she, but she's spouting off like she's an authority and there's millions of people who listen and, the, and they're carried away by fame. We today follow people and listen to people and believe people if they're rich or famous or both. And so we unfortunately need to pay attention to what people are saying, even if they're ignorant, because people listen and they're swayed by it. Okay, who else wanted to speak? Okay, we've got Roberta next and then Harris. Go ahead, Roberta. Uh, it really bothers me when people call Jews a race. Since there are Jews of many races, there are black Jews, there are falashas, there are Chinese Jews, there are Indian Jews, all, all races. So uh, we are not a race. Oh, that, Correct. that really bothers me. Okay, second of all, <clears throat> when, when people say Hitler was not, uh, anti-racial uh, blacks, Hitler w had a fit in 1936 when Jesse Owens, a, an American Negro, beat the German runner. Hitler was ready to have a heart attack, okay? Hitler himself was such a hypocrite. He talked about the Aryans. He had black hair. The whole, the whole German racial superiority was ridiculous, but it bothers me to this day when people will say people of your race, because they know I'm, I'm very overtly Jewish, okay? <clears throat> uh, Jews are not a race. We're a culture, we're a religion. There are a lot of Jews who are not interested in the religious part, but they're very culturally Jewish, very strongly, but we're certainly not a race. Would you yeah, say it's a lot easier to know if a person is a Jew in contrast to know if someone is a Christian? You mean by looking at them? Is that what you're saying? Well, uh, how do you, uh, in Christianity, it has to do with what belief do you have to believe to be a Christian? The Jewish right. tradition does not have that requirement, right? Right, well, let me just respond to what Roberta said, because she's 100% correct. Judaism is not a race. However, there is a biological genetic component to it in that the Jewish people originated in the Middle East and originated according to the Torah from the children of Abraham, but they were a tribe. They were a tribe and they also had people from other tribes. So originally Jewish people started out as a genetically distinct group with, with exogamy as well. And then over the centuries, it became much more than that. So today Judaism is unique. It's not like Christianity. In Christianity, it's you're you're a Christian based strictly on belief, strictly on your belief system. And there was a, a, a kind of a morbid joke during the Irish conflict. The guy the guy is like beating up on this other guy. And he says, "Why are you hitting me?" He says, I, I, "I'm not even. Uh, I'm just. I'm an atheist. I'm not even religious." He goes, "Yeah, but are you a Catholic atheist or a Protestant atheist?" <laughs> so the the, the 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 morbid kind of joke is that. Christianity is basically based on a belief. And if you don't have the belief in Jesus or whatever, you're not Christian. Judaism is based, it's a religion, but it's also a culture. It's also a civilization. It's also a, a family, which has been expanded through exogamy and mixed marriages. So it can be a lot of things. You can be religiously Jewish, culturally Jewish, ethically Jewish. You could be a cardiac Jew. You're Jewish in your heart. You can be... A, you know, a, a gastronomic Jew, you eat Jewish food, you can be a revolving door Jew, you come in on Rosh Hashanah and you leave on Yom Kippur. I mean, there's a lot of different types of Jews. There's even atheist Jews, and you can be a Jewish atheist. We have them. They're humanistic Jews. So it's different. But as far as recognizing a Jewish person, it's different than any other religion, because you can get, you can become part of the Jewish people in many, many different ways. Um, who, who else? Go ahead. Harris. Go ahead, Harris. Harris. Okay, there's a situation. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. 
Okay, there's a situation that really bothered me. In Orlando, Florida, a Jewish student was attacked. A Jewish student was attacked by the Nazis. Okay, and when they found out, Orlando has one of the biggest Nazi groups in the country, and there was very little press. The Jews didn't do anything. They didn't say anything. There was nothing happened. Jews don't rally. Jews are collecting money for all these things. They should worry about anti-Semitism. And they're not, it's not the feature thing with Jews. Do you agree with me, Barry? Harris, I agree with you 100%. I, I don't think we're, uh, we're, we're not on top of the situation. And in Europe, it's illegal in many countries to wear a Nazi uniform or have Nazi insignia. Why is that? Because in Europe, they saw the horrors of Nazism and millions and millions of people were killed. America thinks, oh, we don't have to worry about that. We're above it all. It could never happen here. What, what's the big deal? So we, and we also have a, a, a this fetish with freedom of speech where you can say anything you want, no matter how vile or how dangerous. I, I disagree with that. And I don't agree with the ACLU in championing the right of Nazis to wear their uniform. I say when you kill 6 million people, you forfeit your right to speak. You forfeit sure. your right to have an, 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 a uniform. Your rights to speak and advocate mass murder don't quite add up to the right of Jewish people to live without fear. So I don't I don't agree with the laws of the United States. And I, and I agree with you, Fritz. And I also agree that in the memory of those millions of people who died in the Holocaust because of a lie, by being told you killed Jesus and this is why. And the people, the Jews that died throughout history in their memory, the Crusades, the Inquisition, the pogroms, the ghettos over a lie. I think in, to restore their honor, we who are all able to today speak out freely, we have an obligation to refute the lie and say it's not true and to refute the ridiculous nonsense that God is gonna send all the Christians up to heaven and Jews he's gonna send to purgatory. That is a vile comment, and it attributes to God a, a particularly vicious type of intolerance towards Jews that leaves his followers to carry it out, too. Now, I know what I'm saying is politically incorrect. I know a lot of Jewish people listening right now are going to say, how can you say this? It's going to cause problems. And I know that there's newspapers and communities that are going to say, I'm not allowed to speak there because I'm telling the truth. But I'll be darned if the Jewish people are not allowed to speak up and protect ourselves from blasphemy and lies and the original blood libel, and the worst crime in the history of the world, deicide, deicide attributed to Jewish people in a story that I know you understand Fritz has made up, and I'll, and I'll repeat it for everybody else if you haven't heard it, but there's a story in Christian scripture that Pontius Pilate is portrayed as a sweet, innocent guy who's really the Hitler of right, his time. Right, says, I read hey, that. Hey, we want to release a prisoner, and the Jewish mob yells out, crucified right. Jesus may as well be upon us and our children. That story never happened because the Romans never had a policy to release a prison. So this story was made up to put the blame on the Jews and the Jewish people, historians and rabbis and scholars who know it's a lie, don't even say it. They don't even say this is a lie. I detest... Harris, go ahead. I, I obviously detest the anti-Semitism that's going on now, but in a sense, it's feeding into what I am trying to do. It gives me all kinds of ammunition when I try to talk with the, the presence of our seminary and our bishop, because what's happening in our country, how can they deny this? And the fact that our God is anti-Semitic and that our God condemns the Jews, it just, what's happening in our country feeds into my argument of how we have to do something about this. And what do you suggest that we do? What the, I'm interested in what are the Christians going to do? Well, what do you suggest they do? Well, I suggest that they, they uh, we've changed so many things in Christianity, but the, but the most dangerous thing we have not yet changed. And that's what we have to come to grips with. And our whole idea about what the crucifixion was all about and who Jesus was, if he, if he did exist, he was another person just like you and I who was trying to, trying to make some changes in society. And we have to recognize this and grow up and realize that we don't need to maintain this kind of mythology because it creates hate and animosity. Okay. So you, you agree that it creates hate towards Jewish people and it's been causing or, harm? It creates hatred against everyone who's not like us. 
Right. Jews included and other non-Christians. <laughs> they all fall into that category if we don't like you. It, it, it kind of reminds me of, I know that there was a lot of controversy going on at the time of Jesus, 2,000 years ago. And people were having uh, theological debates. And, and that is great. But what happened to, with Christians was that they got tired of listening to what other people were saying. And they said, uh, no, no, I've had, I'm tired of listening to you. You're going to hell. And God agrees with me. <laughs> End of story. We're moving on. They just were not interested in a continuing a debate about theology. They just wanted their way, and that's the only way. Well, that's why I like having you on, because we believe in discussing things rationally and having a, an honest discussion among friends so that we can explore where we went wrong and how we can get right. Of course, it's true that in Christian theology, if you're the other, if you don't believe in Jesus, then you're consigned to hell. But there's a special place for Jews because Jews were supposed to be the chosen people and now we did something wrong. And the crucifixion of Jesus is attributed to the Jews. In fact, in the early days of Christianity, Jesus is quoted in Christian scripture as saying, I'm going to come back in all my glory. And they said, when is that going to be? And he said, within the lifetime of some of the people right here. And so afterwards, people said 100 years later, well, what happened? I guess Jesus got it wrong. He couldn't be the Messiah or the Son of God. He said he's coming back, and he's not here. So the response to, by the Christian fathers was, oh, he intended to be, but the Jews didn't accept him. And so we have to get the Jews to come around because they're holding up the whole paradise thing. So we got to... We move somewhat. We move somewhat beyond Martin Luther, who was a, a, an anti-Semitic, anti-Semitic through and through. Uh, right. When I was in seminary, we never had anything. I don't remember ever having a special negative attitude for Jews. They were just a part of all the others who were not Christian. Um, maybe there was in other seminaries, but I never felt any <laughs> that you folks had a special. <laughs> there was something <laughs> special for you folks that, that everybody else was not going to get. <laughs> Well, Martin Luther certainly didn't feel that way. Martin oh, Luther had it in for Absolutely him. not. Absolutely not. He did. There was definitely a special place for Jews. Yeah. <laughs> in, in fact, many of his policies were adapt, adopted verbatim by the Nazis. The, the identifying Jewish star, not being able to own land, not being able to go to school, with everybody else being put into ghettos. This was all, um, this was all his blueprint. For, at, when, in his book, or his treatise, where he wrote of the Jews and their lies, the, that blueprint was pretty much carried out by Hitler and then so. Um, anybody else want to share yes. anything? Yes, Valerie has her hand raised for a while now. Go ahead, Valerie. Yeah. Well, a couple of things. First of all, I think we all know that in case some of us have forgotten, uh, Hitler, if, as, we, as, as he is known, was named uh, Adolf Schuckelgruber and he was a Jew from Austria. That's the first thing. So he oh. wasn't, yeah, for, so he was just a nut job that everybody followed, okay? Because he was Jewish. That's the first thing. So there is his first, that's your first big problem. Also, what distinguishes Jews from other people? We are, it, it, you, you do have a genetic disposition because Jewish people are part of the Semitic race, okay? The Semitic race suffers from a thing called Tay-Sachs disease, which is a blood disorder. The blacks suffer from a disease called sickle cell anemia. So if you are part of the Semitic people, it is genetic. There is a genetic predisposition to being Jewish along with all the cultural other stuff the rabbi has talked about. So in answer to just that question, you have to keep that under, uh, under advisement. Also, Yahshua, as some people know, J Jesus, okay? He preached the word of the God of Abraham. So if you believe in uh, Yahshua or Christian, that makes you more Jewish than me because he preached the word of the God of Abraham. So if you believe that, you're a better Jew than I am, okay? <laughs> <laughs> That's what I have to say. And the guy next door to me, the first question he asked when he moved in to my husband, may he rest in peace, is are you Christian? And the question that I said to him, are you talking about the Jewish guy that was hung on the cross? Is that the guy you're talking about? Okay, and he shut up really very quickly, okay? So that's just a, just, just a couple of little pointers that we have to bring out that are factual. Well, I've, been, I, I've been accused of not being a Christian. And I said, but I follow what Jesus said was the greatest teaching. So how can and I you're not? You're Jewish. I had to tell you that. You're a better <laughs> Jew than I am. 
Hey, Fritz, don't, don't worry, tell anybody because she'll shock the hell out of them. <laughs> yeah. Well, I've been told by many that I'm not really Jewish, so I guess we're on uh, we're on even footing. And why aren't um, you Jewish? And Barry, why, why aren't I Jewish? Yeah, why because I Jewish? because I don't I believe that the God of the Torah, who goes around ordering genocide and slaughtering people because they're worshiping the wrong way or stoning disrespectful children or executing people who don't observe the Sabbath, I, I believe that that God is fictional and represents the first stage in our moral evolution and uh, not our last. And so the, the fundamentalists who are blind and uh, just blindly follow authority, they find that this is very threatening to them. And so they say, well, I'm not really Jewish because I don't believe in that God. By the way, 99.9% .9 of Jewish people don't believe in a God who orders genocide. They consider that mythology also, but I happen to say it. And so they, uh, I hold a special place of opprobrium in their mind. As far as what Valerie is saying, as I mentioned before, the Jews emerged from a genetic stock, a distinct genetic people. However, you can convert your way into Judaism and be of a totally different genetic stock. And so unlike, um, like if you're like Africans or blacks, you can't convert and say, okay, I'm now going to become black. I mean, you can identify with their culture, but they're, you're, you're right, Valerie, in that we shared in the past much more of a genetic similarity, and we still do, as reflected in certain diseases, but you can also join in other ways. By the way, I, I just want everybody to be clear on this. There are no people who are actually white or black. Those terms don't really mean very much. Everyone is a shade of brown, so to speak except maybe for an albino, and even they're not a pure white. All of us are not white or black. We're different shades of brown. By the way, white and black are really kind of like the same color. White reflects all the colors, all of them. And black absorbs all the colors equally. The colors that we see are because certain wavelengths are reflected out in different ways, but black and white are just either reflecting or absorbing all the different colors. So saying that we're black or white doesn't really it's sloppy language. We're really all one people and there's certain distinctions among us, but the color of our skin has loomed very large and it shouldn't have. And it's very, very unfortunate. And so we're, uh, we're still in our infancy as a species, still trying to grapple with how to deal with people who are different genetically, racially, religiously. And uh, I, I just wanna get your take on mouse and then maybe we can call it a day. This, this book, was banned, I believe it was in Tennessee by a school board there. And I'm curious to get everybody's reaction to that. Does anybody here want to opine on that the banning of that book? It really jumped in popularity. <laughs> it went to the best seller. It just, just went right to the top. Yeah, that's true. That's a good yeah, thing. Go ahead, Valerie. As soon as you say you can't, as soon as you say you can't do something, everybody wants to do it. But that's also part of an, I don't want to say liberal mentality, but for lack of a better word, they're trying to rewrite history. They're trying to rewrite what they want it to be. And that's just following the way things are. And until the general population wakes up and sees that, and until you start voting on the on the local level for those people that have a little bit more intelligence and have cups in their head and can think independently. And what is real and what is not real, you're going to have the same situation repeating itself over and over and over. You can't rewrite history. You might want to deny it. You might want to ignore it, but you sure as hell can't change it. And as soon as people wake up to that, the better off we're going to be. And you've got to start educating people in that area. Very well said. Um, I think, go ahead, Harris. I have a question for Fritz. In as much as people are dropping out of religion like crazy, how do you think it's going to be in the next 50 years? Well, that's why I kind of wonder why I'm still battling with the Lutherans. Uh, why don't I just give up? Because if, if we maintain our present theology, it is just going to die off. It's just going to die off. Yes. Yeah. So, so what do you suggest, the, Fritz? Especially the Catholics. Well, I think because I think there's so much good in, there can be so much good in uh, the, the teachings of religious leaders that... Uh, we need to we need to keep that alive and 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 not to screw it all up by all the other stuff that uh, we think is important that has to be yeah. a, a part of a part of it. 
uh, there, there's so many gems that are great. And uh, I, 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 there are so many things that Barry and I could preach on that are fantastic when it comes to some re what religious leaders and what has been carried, handed down to us over the ages. But it's been so messed up by these other extraneous things that we have made. Just like I said, we replace what Jesus said was the greatest commandment with John 3.16. And which, which goes totally against, I believe, what Jesus said was the greatest teaching. But we, we've got to uh, use some rational thought and, and, and focus on what really helps people and not what hurts people or divides people. Yeah. Well, I read something. For those something who are not familiar with John, let's tell everybody what John 3.16 Well, John 3.16 is that God so loved the world that he gave his only forgotten son, not forgotten son, only begotten. <laughs> Only begotten son <laughs> that whoever believes in him will, will not will, will not perish but have eternal life. I reminded a seminary president of this verse, and and she sent back the verse to me, but she left out the last half of it. She she pointed out how loving God was to give his son for us, but she left out the second half of the verse. How can how can someone do that? I oh, guess wow. it's just going from bad to verse. <laughs> A bad to first, yes. Yes, I think so. That's pretty good. Maybe that's yeah. the definition of ignorance. That is. Uh, there, well, there certainly is a lot of ignorance in the uh, world of religion. They do, not, to, they do not want to focus on the ugly underbelly of Christianity. There's so much that is good about it, but there's a, this underbelly that is horrible. It, it, we, we've got to do something about it. Uh, you true. know what, I... I would like to, to conclude the discussion with, with your remark, and then I'm going to feed off of that, and I'm going to mention the next time we're going to discuss critical race theory and uh, racism as a systemic in the United States, and uh, we'll be doing that soon. But I just want to feed off of what you're saying. You say the Christians don't want to acknowledge the other, ugly underbelly of their religion, which is really based on replacement theory, where they replace the Jews, and the Jews are now... The, as you said, the forgotten son, <laughs> that the Jews were supposed to be right. the children of God and now we're the forgotten son. So <laughs> it, it's an ugly underbelly and it has a lot of negative ramifications, which is why I say, I'm not convinced that if it makes somebody feel good, then let them believe it. Because if what they believe makes them feel good, but, making, but they feel good because they're persecuting Jews or thinking less of us, it's not a good thing. But I see the same thing with America. So people say, America exceptionalism, we're the, we're the greatest. So in order to make that stick, they have to ignore slavery, ignore racism, ignore genocide, or trivialize it, or beat down those people who are trying to say it, and then use a buzzword like critical race theory and say, no, you can't say this, you shouldn't teach this. And they also want to suppress knowledge about the Holocaust because the United States did nothing to stop it. And, and we even had an America First movement. And so it makes us look bad. I like honesty. Let's just say the United States has done incredible things. It's a bastard of freedom, but we've also done some horrible things. And let's just tell it like it is. And let's exactly, exactly. let the chips fall where they may. Yeah. By the way, the, the slogan of the Nazis, Deutschland über alles. Deutschland über alles means Germany first. Mm -hmm. The equivalent- <laughs> familiar, doesn't it? it? Sounds a little familiar. The equivalent well, I, of that is America first, right? Now, America first wasn't invented by Donald Trump. No, no, no. He, he adopted the slogan, but he didn't invent it. It was actually used by Lindbergh, and it was used by the neo-Nazis and people in the 30s and early 40s who wanted to keep the Amer America out of World War II. They were called the America first movement. And they had a lot of Nazis in them and they wanted, they had no issue with the Holocaust or with Hitler. They were, some of them were allies of them. And so it's unfortunate that this name, America First, would be adopted by a modern political party, which is um, rather problematic. So we, um, we don't do ourselves any favors if we say never again and we don't learn the lessons of the past. The lesson of the past is that the United States is not immune. We've been seeing that in the last few years and we need to get it out of our head that it couldn't happen here. It could happen here. The beginnings of it are happening here and we need to change the way religion is taught. Uh, Lador Vador, we believe, 
that if religion is rational, logical, and we are willing to challenge assumptions like they do in science and, and challenge sacred cows and believe what's, what makes sense, then we have a fighting chance as a species. But blind obedience to authority, as Einstein said, is the greatest enemy of the truth. And here we will not blindly obey authority. I know Fritz doesn't. Yeah. And I know and, we don't at Lador Bador. And we'll keep yes. defying authority when it's wrong. So Fritz, thank you we, so much for the first installment. Go ahead, I'll give you the last word now before we conclude. I've, I've, been, I've been using the word with Christians that we believe in Christian supremacy. How ugly is that? Yeah. But that's what that's our faith right. teaches, Christian supremacy. Right. And I think it's you might have got it from Jewish. The Nazis did. Right. And you might have, I think that's a variant of a disease called Jewish supremacy, where we're the chosen ones. And it's a variant in Christianity and Islam, which is even more lethal and more contagious than it was in Jewish scripture. So we'll end it at that. It was a pleasure speaking you. with you.